All right. So yeah, so we've we've built a bit this panel today with the idea of, as I was saying, a bit giving uh, a feedback from the ground because you've seen what what technology companies see, you see what Artifact sees. I wanted to also give the word to to the people that are actually hear all of it, and I wanted to um, when we built it, we wanted to also give different perspectives. Because what you can probably also notice is. Everyone has a bit its own experience with Gen AI, and actually every experience is quite relevant as long as it's relevant for, for the business. And uh, so we, we've got with us uh, so a good representation of very different perspectives. So I'm gonna, if that's okay, I'm going to do a quick introduction uh, for our guests, and then please correct me then if I've built a quick introduction for you guys. So I'm going to start in the order of uh, maybe, and uh, just because it's, it's like this, so Pierre, I'm going to start with you if that's okay. So Pierre, you uh, are the director of data analytics uh, for finance HR applications at Bayersdorf. Uh, you have uh, merged, restructured, transformed easy IT teams to be ready for AI, for what's going to come uh, with AI as well. So around uh, a future-looking data analytics and AI organization. You work closely, we work closely with you uh, at Bayersdorf, but uh, beyond that, uh, I think you've been uh, for us the one really like opening the door to all the things that Biosoft is doing now, which uh, on on AI, which I would like to cover with you today. Uh, and you've come with Stefan, who is uh, working alongside you. Uh, Stefan, you are the head of AI and automation at Biosoft. You are uh, implementing uh, AI at the enterprise level uh, for all functions, and I think that's something that's quite rare in organization that. You've got someone already in charge of everything AI across the organization from R&D, supply, marketing, finance, everywhere. Um, you uh, also manage all the teams that have to translate the requirements of the business into actual solutions. So welcome to the panel. Uh, we've got also today George uh, joining us. George, you are a chief uh, revenue uh, officer at Digisruptor. So Digisruptor for uh, the audience here, they are one of our partners uh, working with us now for uh, more than a year. Um, and you have been a, co a company founding three years ago. So it's quite a recent company. And it's quite an interesting uh, new style of company because you are in two businesses at the same time. So at the same, you are executive search. So you are recruiting for executives. Most of them would have an AI agenda when they join a company. But at the same time, you help companies as well. Uh, finding the right set of solutions when they want to launch a, a new technology as if you want AI. And uh, we've got Ian as well, who uh, is one of your, uh, of, 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 is part of your of your network as well. And Ian, you've been having a long uh, history in taking the responsibility of a CTO in a number of organizations. Uh, especially now, you're the Group Chief uh, Technology Officer at City Now. And you're also the board uh, of a number of startups, including uh, Nexa Conta. Uh, you have spent more than 30 years, if I'm allowed to say. I know what I'm okay. As I'm here, I'm not a And uh, I think what, what what is particularly interesting for today is, in the recent times, you've been doing and backing a number of startups that have been able to multiply by 10 their value through specifically AI acquisitions or putting AI at the core of the product. Yeah. So um, I think today what what I wanted to present to the audience here is the fact that we've got a, a diverse panel of big companies top in their field in the beauty business in the world to smaller also startups really making AI the core of the value creation. And I wanted then, before we, we move ahead, to start first with a, a, a quick definition of what Gen AI is. And if that's okay, Ian, to give you a bit of perspective of how do we define Gen AI? We've seen so many examples here. Yeah. We see it covers so many things. And before we get into more details, I wanted to tell your views on how you would define Gen AI, especially in the context of making uh, impact on business. No, absolutely. So I think, you know, uh, one of the things that a lot of people, yeah, I like and um, one of the things that um, a lot of organizations confuse uh, the uh, the notion of wanting to get involved in AI um, is, well, we must do it because the board said so, or our investors said so, or we must do it because our competition might be doing it. And 
AI traditionally was a, a capability whereby you would ask a, a, a machine to come up with a correct output to something based on a set of data that you gave it. Gen AI is taking that concept further and beyond the machine learning space where you're actually asking it to come up with a range of answers to a question or a problem statement that comes up with generating new content or sentiment on content, looking at generating new images or image analysis or actually generating real world content, be that things like training materials or be that documentation or actual output that's generating value. And I think that's the biggest thing that Gen AI needs to be applied to in any organization is the creation of value, not just technology for technology's sake. Um, and I'm saying that as a technologist uh, for 30 plus years, and, and it's something that has to be taken into consideration. And Gen AI in that space has to be generating something genuinely new for an organization that in turn generates value to the customers, the business, the investors, and the people. Thank you. And if you can pass on to, 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 to George, George, I wanted to you know, come back to what Ian was just saying. Do the generating value. Today, when you look at all the companies that you're working with in different countries as well, I forgot to say, guys, who is, to your mind, really making the best use or the most use of Gen AI at the moment? So what we see, so our business is with the conduit between companies that have business challenges and we provide capability in two forms, knowledge such as Ian um, and partners such as Artifact to create the capability and bridge the gap with a, uh, ultimately a business strategy. So what we see is, you know, our sweet spot organization is a 50 million to half a billion revenue organization that has the agenda of how do we scale profitably. And so the notion of companies adopting Gen AI is very much about how do we use it to our advantage, a bit like what Ian's saying. So what we have in terms of capability is a set of companies like financial banks, for example, that are looking at open banking APIs, a very big landscape of, of, of technology, um, which is very, very deep in sandboxes. So banks, you, would you say that banks are the kind of like the early adopters? Because that's a little bit counterintuitive to me that, you know, the financial services sector would be one of the most advanced when it comes to Jamaica. Yeah, you, you can. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the, what, what George is trying to say is what you have is a lot of organizations that are looking how to how, how best to implement it. And financial services has gone a long way in this space. But so have, have healthcare and analytical. But yeah, I, I, I was working with a with an organization that's looking at taking information out of MRI scans and CT scans and then building actual output from that, which is being used in the real world to deliver patient value or value into drug trials data. And I think there's no necessarily any particular vertical that's leading the charge on this. I think what it is about is looking across all of the different verticals. I spent my career, I've never pigeonholed in any particular vertical. It happens to be automotive software right now. Uh, eight months ago or six months ago, it was maritime software. Before that, it was regulatory and compliance software. And there's relevant use cases in all of those verticals that allow you to be able to do those things. And what we're seeing with the people that we're working with and the clients that we're working with inside DigiDisruptor um, is looking at those customers through the lens of how do we generate value with these tools and how do you generate value for your customers and your investors? Cool, thank you. Pierre, at Biosdor, which is probably, I mean, like a company that doesn't exist just from yesterday, right? That has been there for a couple of years already. What do you think? The, so how long ago? 1882. 1882. Wow. Uh, that's, you're uh, going to to the 150 years. A bit more than three. <laughs> it could be advantage, but also disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. How, how, how do you prioritize the AI agenda and the general agenda, especially at Biosdorf? How do you decide what comes first, what to do first, what to do second? And can you give us a bit of a flavor of what that uh, general agenda is uh, for Biosdorf? Yeah. So probably I start, I don't know, but everybody knows Biosdorf. Now there is a lot of beauty products in, so especially Nivea, Usury, also some luxuries like Lapari. Um And that is an advantage. It is also challenging because it's physical products. We are not a digital company, uh, also not a technology company. Uh, and that is something Stefan and myself, we experienced quite 
soon when we joined that company and we uh, started with a business and there we were facing the challenge that, okay, how to do real analytics at that time. So three years ago, more or less. Mm -hmm. And what we were lacking at that time, because the IT was more focusing on optimizing costs, being there to provide just the infrastructure. And uh, we lacked the infrastructure and all the architecture to do analytics, to do AI. So we then, with a new CIO coming in, we actively decided, okay, let's change sites. We move into the internal IT of Firestore and we try to make it from inside the IT happen that data analytics can be somehow spawned over the whole company. Let's call it like that. Mm. And the challenge there, of course, is that the company like Firestore is always setting guardrails for investments. So the same counts for IT. So you got a certain budget. That budget is, of course, also kind of prioritized to certain functions, but then you have to come up with certain projects, ideas. And that is also a challenge for data analytics because you have to be, you have to be quite early to get something out of that budget, no? Because, of course, it is functionally driven. You invest in supply chain, you invest in sales, you invest in marketing, not necessarily in data analytics. That is somehow which is coming afterwards. And also, you have not these big projects in mind. That was something that we both had to change quite at the beginning. And we made that easy because we said, okay, you have always four pillars you have to think about. That's You need a roadmap, you need ideas, you call the business cases, value for the company, you need the capabilities, you need a way how to work together, and that means business and IT, um, and you need the infrastructure. So it's not because we are both so clever, but now the infrastructure is there, and we've heard it today, I think, Technology is not the problem. It is more how to get the ideas and how to get the right, right cases for the company to lift the value. And that is how we start now prioritizing our digital agenda based on business cases. And that is you all uh, the functions. And for Gen AI, I mean, also that we need to be uh, honest, it is quite recently. Of course, AI was always on the agenda, but Gen AI came well. And that is something where we invest also as an IT function and especially with uh, Stefan's team um, on ideation. Fr frame with the business together, what is the idea? What is exact exactly what you need? And, and where is the challenge? And then the technology comes in. And of course that you do with mixed teams and especially with yeah, either engineers, be it architects, and then on the business side, domain experts and product owners, of course. Cool. And Stefan, is that okay to ask uh, what those great ideas are that you've come up with, with working on ideation with the business? What, what have you come up to? It is okay. And we already got the answer on, on the screen earlier today, which was um, don't start new hobbies, right? Or yeah, the, the colleague said it, don't start new hobbies. So like, just think of what you're already doing and then identify opportunities of making that just better. And again, as we learned, we research our products, we manufacture our products around the globe, we distribute them, warehousing questions, logistics questions. We build fantastic brands, all the brands Pierre mentioned, and then ultimately we also to sell somewhere. This is where we do then joint e-commerce projects, right? And, and, and that's a wonderful buffet for general use cases, right? So for instance, R&D, yeah, that's 800 people really doing ground research. Yes, a lot of obviously the innovation is also coming from marketing and the market, but still you really have this, these people with these white outfits in the lab and they have a, a myriad of data sources they need to manage. Right? Your SharePoint with studies, patent databases, chemical ingredient databases, no two data sources um, have the same format, right? Can I just access that and democratize, democratize the knowledge? Can I infer the author of particular subsets of the field, right? That's something where we already, by the way, in the 5%, that's the first ship case since recently. Yeah? And then you continue. Obviously, we pursue a lot of creative work that is generating content that we publish on our own website and networks, social media. Yeah, That's where we are in an MVP phase um, to, to write some, let's say, a content engine, where again, technology, that's one thing and, and we easily overcome that, but you touch the, the business process, right? Like how people today work in, in, in this creative field. And for instance, another case we also saw on the screen today, um, that uh, you can actually call us yeah, if you have a question yeah, and say, hey, 
my baby was eating th th that particular cream, right? what's going to happen next, right? And then someone will really pick up the phone. Uh, that person has a list of standard operating procedures, right? So you, yeah, yeah and, and, and that's, you, you don't scan them all like at, at the time where the client is on the, or the, the consumer is on the phone, right? And then now they get a chatbot where they just ask and ideally they can then directly solve the situation on the spot. Worst case, they need to call back, right? But you really uh, make that a more approachable. And then like that, yeah, like we just go through this. We do research, we build brands and need content for that. We have consumers and search our cases along that value chain of my stock. Who, who, who would you say as, as the idea most of the time when you do that work? Is it? No, never us. It's never us. Like we, never you. I mean, we're not so creative, but, but that's, that's what uh, some of us are, yeah, but, but that's why the white. Why does all that look as well? <laughs> yeah. No, but like. But, but we have all these people in the company. Yeah? We have 21,000 people in the field uh, that, that really know what they're doing. And then the art is, and that's the third pillar that Pierre mentioned, is this, this operating model of how do we get business, digital business, and then IT together. And you can start from two angles. These trivial cases, I call them, that I just mentioned, like we create content yeah, with the dozens of agencies around the globe in like 80 countries. Yeah? Um, Obviously, that's a, an obvious one, but then that's one ang ang angle we come from, so the known use cases, and the other angle is just exposing people to technology, for instance, and, and then you gamify a bit. So, for instance, we did a program with our digital R&D function where people had to apply. There was no limited number of seats, but still, they had to apply for being exposed to sandbox environments where they can then just... Um, play around with some R&D data in a cybersecurity, legal data, whatever compliance space, but they had to consent to, I will document the use case in a certain template so that we then have afterwards, we had then 40 use cases only in that part of the organization. And then someone else prioritizes. That's also what PMH, right? We, we would never prioritize on our side. We then make the dream happen. Coming back to your one map, Pierre, which is probably your first PR, right? Yeah. Uh, if I got it right. Do you think it's one map of for by us in total, do you think it's going to be a roadmap of, I think Vincent was talking 30,000 users and so many 160 tests. Do you think it's kind of this scale of a roadmap or you believe Gen AI is not going to be that, that the, let's say, multiplication of initiatives, but really selecting a few and, and the roadmap is actually a, a roadmap of big bets rather than the roadmap of democratization of a lot, lot of use cases. Because if I hear stuff and there is an element of everyone has an idea, of doing Gen AI for themselves. But how, how do you know about, uh, about being an IT organization having to deliver all of that at the end? Yeah. Uh, um, so luckily enough, we pitched last year also to the board to at least get a general commitment for an investment over the next three years. That is in AI data and the platform. Because that is one, what you mentioned, uh, how, NA, how to enable also others, not only the IT function, whatever it cases, to scale and leverage uh, Gen AI, for example, is providing them access to a platform. That was what we invested the last two years in as well, uh, a data and analytics platform, which exactly enables them, for example, the R&D department to work in a safe space, to start experimenting, and then later consulted by us and also working with us, scaling our industrialization now for these cases through hold the company. Um, currently, I think it is, we are still in a kind of an exploration phase. So there are really cool cases coming up with a lot of value for the company. But you can see that we are not sure yet. So the business is not sure yet. And that's mm -hmm. exactly where we play an important role to say, okay, it is not so expensive. Try it out. You do not have to globally scale it immediately. You can do pilots. And that is something which is, at least for a company like Biostoff new as well over the last year, mm -hmm. that you start really small and you give people the chance to, to work with it. And there is one example, which I'm personally fascinated as well, and it is not so complex. Stefan can explain more details even. Um, all these regulatory uh, requirements from the EU, EU, uh, EU coming out, they have a huge impact on our products. And you can imagine that the impact on sales could be quite negative if you are still selling products with critical ingredients. What we are using now is they're getting published. Every of these policies and uh, papers are getting published. We just, together with the uh, R&D department, 
with Gen uh, AI models, we just name or prompted accordingly what are the most important and critical topics you need to know in advance in order to foster uh, more flexible formula development or even to know quite in advance which ingredients we have to replace with non-critical ones. And that is something which you can't see it yet, but I think that adds a lot of value to the company. And it also releases a lot of the pressure to the, from the employees you know, and a lot of work. So yeah. the, uh, it is a mixture of what you said, single cases and then scale and enable the whole population of the company to work with it. And to, to have the tradition to, uh, I wanted to ask questions to Drew. And to ask Second time lucky. <laughs> <laughs> What do you say is the success rate of, of Genia? We've seen, you know, I would say less than 10 percent. Vincent was saying five percent. Do you think, you know, with your with today where you are, you have a success rate of oh, this is the right case, and you manage to actually make it, make it successful? That gives you more than one one in a ten kind of like success rate in in what you're trying at the moment. All for it, I would say. It depends. Also, like, yeah. like where does the case start? Right? It, do you start with the idea? Yeah, just a quick one. Yeah, but do you start with the idea or do you start with the investment, pilot, right? With the, you, you've yeah. tried, you've done a pilot and you managed to scale that pilot. What is your success rate in that, you would say? I don't have the number, in, in, exact, in, I don't have statistics on that, right? But like the, the, the art is to really carefully find the sweet spot of where you start to invest yeah, and then how much, right? And then on that, you, you have a success rate or not. But most of the stuff, and, and then the success rate is quite, let, let's say like 50% or something, whether it's 30, 40, 60, I couldn't tell. But rather invest on some of the more promising cases than just like starting, like what also someone mm -hmm. else already said today, starting the same thing all over the organization. And then obviously, naturally, if you don't really follow up on that with people investments, uh, then, mm -hmm. then, then your success rate will be small. I would say 50 percentage. 50 percent. Because my why? Uh, because even if a case somehow from a from a model perspective and from from the result seems to be good, unfortunately, it needs still people to convince the decision makers and the company to invest in that case. So easy it is because there is a threshold or budget, and then the question is when and how you are going to scale it. That's why there are really good pilots. Uh, but if the budget is limited, then of course you invest not necessarily always in Gen AI because there are other digital, cool digital projects as well. We have to run, like e commerce, for example. Mm -hmm. Probably if you should <laughs> blue it's Gen AI and e commerce, then we have combined it. Yeah, that's for but, Harry. I don't know where uh, Harry is. Yeah, it's for you. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, George. So, first of the transition, I wanted to ask you what do you think is the reason for success? And can you give us a couple of companies that you believe have been successful with Gen AI? To yeah. a matter that, you know, I mean, at that, not only for the employees, but also at business at the CEO level, it has actually made an impact and, and why. So one use case example is a um, media company that ultimately had created a product where it was taking journalists that had wanted to do some research and come up with like a hunch, for example. And what it basically did was utilize a lot of the the uh, research data in across the world or whatever to come up with a theory around is this article something we should invest in? Is this article going to be true, something obscure? And they typed this hunch in and what would come out of it is a percentage score. Now, this was about six to nine months ago. The challenge for the organization was the cost. Um, the adoption was really good because whatever the example might be is, you know, the adoption of AI going to be quite lucrative in the Middle East because there's a, a notion of 40,000 AI developers in that region by 2030. That would be something that the media company could take to market and write an article on. Um, the hunch engine was quite powerful and accurate, but cost a lot of money. So it was like a quarter of a million a month in compute power and, and cost about nine months ago. So they turned it off. So that was an example of where it it didn't quite go well. Um, the companies we work with and talk to, they're much smaller. So they don't have the R&D budget. They don't have the resources. They don't have the capability. They don't have the leaders. Their CTOs have been developers for 10 years and by default, they're a CTO. 
the CEOs are not technology savvy, right? They're stuck in the world of BAU. Culturally, they don't experiment. So the notion of let's do AI is a question every board is asking today because of the fear of not doing it, competition, et cetera. And when we go into boardrooms and have conversations, what comes out downstream is a set of activities that need to happen to enable the generative AI narrative across the business. Where is your data? How is that kept? How is that clean? What's the, you know, the data architecture of the organization? Who owns it, right? And then from there, it's about finding the capability to bridge the gap, just to start on that thread and understand what is the business strategy and what data do we have? A bit like what Alex was saying about using your own data. How do we leverage that? And then start looking at disruptive technologies to be able to have a competitive edge. Cool, thank you. And, and then in terms of why success, uh, do you have a bit of a view of, you know, seeing all these companies? Yeah. What's so, made a difference between the company that's been successful with it and it's... Yeah. So there's a global um, technology company that we're talking to who have 25, 30 years of RFP data. And they go out to market and propose technology, data center redesign, managed services, etc. And they've got thousands and thousands of different RFP data, ones that have been successful, ones that have failed. And what they're enabling is using Gen AI to disrupt the and, and create pace in understanding the success stories and the failures of previous RFPs. So what that's been able to do is accelerate the pre-sales of those RFPs to get ahead of the competition. And ultimately the first proposal wasn't always the best one, but it's using intelligent insights quite quickly to come up with the most value to the problem statement that's requested by the, by the outcome. So in turn, it's less utilization of your sales function, which gives them more opportunities to win more leads and win more business whilst executing on the current value of that RFP. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Ian, um, I'm interested about like you as, as a CTO in our organization and you felt like, okay, you're going to invest into a, 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 a potential leader, you know, a company you want to invest in to acquire that company in your business or a product you want to know through Gen AI. How, when is the moment that you feel like, okay, this is going to be a success? And how do you know, or how do you define success? Do you know it before you go? Do you know it after you've tried? Do you know it after it has scaled? It's a bit of a random game and you have to do 10 to want to succeed. Uh, how, do you, how do you work success? The cop-out answer is it varies. Uh, <laughs> uh, the real answer is um, the success is driven off the back of the value you derive for the business. The success is derived from what do your people get out of it? How do, you, how, do you, how do you change the culture of the organization to adopt that success and then take it forward? So it's very difficult. So if you let's yeah, give an example where you can use, where we say, right, we want to be able to deliver faster on our technology roadmap. We need to take our legacy platform and we need to move it into the next generation of technology. We need to build the next gen SaaS platform from an old on-premise platform. Yeah. Um, talking to you, you go talk to a bunch of developers about using uh, Copilot coding and they're going to start being very afraid for their jobs. Uh, but you actually, it's the way in which you put that and how you do, how you help them to understand what that success looks like. And it's, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a developer. If I go back far enough, I, I can still do it now. Um, but do I like using Copilot, Copilot coding? Yeah, I do. Because actually what it means is I get a head start. We can do things faster and we can deliver faster and we can add more value. We add more value to the organization. That's not That's not diminishing from my job. That's actually enhancing my value to the business and making my position in the organization more secure. And, and I'm also adopting technology that people want me to adopt and more importantly, delivering on the business outcome. So you can say at the beginning of that process, if you win the hearts and minds of the people that are going to be engaging in the process, then uh, to adopt the technology and to adopt the ability to deliver faster, then you could start to see success at the start. You don't really know whether or not your success is is, is, is manifest until you get to the end and it actually ends up in the hands of your end user or your consumer or whoever it may be, whether or not you're defining and delivering product or whether or not you're defining and delivering software. It's the adoption rate of that. So, yeah. And then when do you know that, for example, I mean, if you, if you are more from an investor standpoint, yeah. you feel, because I think you, you've made one, right, recently where you've actually acquired a company that was 
doing, uh, you have added to your own business and that has multiplied the value of the business yeah. by that note. And uh, uh, at what point you thought this is actually the right thing to do? Because there's a bit of fluff also in, I mean, we need to be about, uh, honest about it. Everyone talks about it. It's amazing. It's amazing. When you look at actually the reality, I mean, there's so much failure in there as well. So at what point you, you fall? Is it a bit of luck or is it, you know, you've managed to distinguish the fluff from the... One of my old CEOs who I have ultimate respect for, and if he ever watches this video, he's going to know exactly who it is, said it's always better to be lucky than good. <laughs> um, but it's awesome to be both. Um, but um, yeah, and, and, and I think we knew at the beginning when we made that acquisition that it was a smart thing to do. We had an idea about what it is we could do with that business and how that would add value to our risk portfolio. Um, and it genuinely did. Um, and you, but we didn't know for certain until we'd gone through the pain of the integration of that acquisition, which integrating acquisitions in any software business is painful. In that particular company, we did 15 in just under four years, um, which was a pace. It's why I don't put my age honest. Um, but yeah, uh, but it was it, but the, the success, it, it, there's markers to success along the way. You know, were the people that we were working with bought into the process? Did they, were, did we bring them in in, an acquis in, in the M&A structure correctly? Were they, did they feel engaged being part of a larger company? Were we adopting the technology in the right way? Did we have the right data sets that sit underpin that? Yeah, to what Luke was saying, you, know, you have to have that, the, the, the amount of data that can train what you're doing. And then ultimately, is what we're actually creating doing something that's going to gener genuinely add value to the organization and... And, and in turn revenue. In this case, it did. Did we really know that was gonna be the case at the outset? We hoped, we thought we were smart enough to know that it would do, and genuinely it did. Um, now, is that, is, that, is that all being smart? No. Is it a bit of luck? Yeah. Is it enough of both? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> cool, thank you very much. Stefan. Uh, yeah, if you can pass on the mic. Uh, talking about that, I mean, uh, in what you've said, uh, one thing I like is, I mean, w the first thing you've looked at is the people, if I understand well, like that company, I mean, we'll have to integrate them and, and so who are, who are the people behind? Uh, Stefan, in your uh, organization, in your, uh, in your job, who are the people you believe that are the most critical to the success of Gen AI around you? I mean, both inside your team and possibly outside your team as well. What are the roles? I mean, people meaning the roles that you really are very critical in the success of, of a Gen AI project. So, that's a classical know your audience case. <laughs> no. Because if it was a tech audience, we could yeah. go deep on engineers, like a tech in terms of engineering, startup, or you know, something like that. Um, because someone needs to make it happen, right? And then eventually you want certain services to be in your network and cybersecurity compliant. And, and, and there's a lot of complexity and technical questions. But then from a different point of view, it's just yet another digitalization project, frankly speaking where the new piece of technology unlocks new use cases. yeah, And then you again have all these change management topics that you would usually have in any other digitalization project, right? And the, the key role there is the person that really makes it land with the end user, because in your organization, you might have a process that where 300 people do something yeah, at certain steps of the process. And from one day to the other, you change the reality, for instance, content creation, you know, where like you have central teams in the headquarters, local teams that then translate and, and uh, let's say uh, tone wise adapt to, to the local needs. Yeah? And then obviously you then start to centralize because you automate. Uh, so you don't need to have so many decentral people, um, just some that fine tune and shepherd the system and so on and so forth. And that, that's a gigantic change. And someone needs to, sh yeah, like, manage that change. That, that's not us from an IT perspective, right? We, we are those that, that make the solution technically happen. But you find many people that can build the solution. You only find few that, that really make it land with the end user, in my perspective. Yeah, and actually there is almost a bit of a paradox uh, in, in what you're saying that, is, that you're highlighting. A paradox of, at the same time, is very similar to a digital project. And at the end, the skills, the people that were around you in the company that were successful for a digital project would be also successful for a general project. But at the same time, I feel like in what you're saying as well, the level of uh, the, the capacity of local countries, if I, because you are in group function, and mm. the capacity of local countries to come up with their own general solution versus building their own website is probably, there's probably a gap no, between like what they were able to do by themselves with just digital alone to 
to Gen AI, it feels like it's a central thing of be able to, to, to do it. So there's some complexity in making it happen. Now what do you think? I, I would agree. Still, websites, there was a thing in 1998 or so, right? When, when, and, and nobody made it work in the first year, right? But, but, but people had time to, to learn, you know, like society, people. Now, now it's a common thing, right? And it's way more approachable. Gen AI just starts to materialize for people, but who knows whether in 20 years from now, it's also way more approachable to, to envision and ship yet another Gen AI use case. But, but this ability to, from one day to the other, jump on a new piece of technology, understand how it relates to your business reality, if you had that capability previously in your organization, that comes in super handy at this time. Pierre, if, if I may, I mean, to the same point a little bit, yeah. what do you think about that level of proactivity that maybe group functions need to have to make Gen.I happen versus maybe some spontaneous, you know, organizations locally that would be able to just take it forward? Probably I would link it as well to the ideation of the and, and, and would also not bear everything to us on the IT side. I would really take the, the corporate and global functions into uh, the responsibility as well, because what they have to achieve is use the global network to ideate on the cases, because you're right with Gen AI, you would have probably also capabilities on the ground in every country, but they need to be orchestrated because what we see is also with the ideations, of course, everybody loves to experiment and then everybody does chat with it. Is it ecologically the right one? Okay, that's another one. But does it really add always value to the company? Not all of them. And that is a big task for central functions to orchestrate that ideation. And it is a task to us to enable for certain cases the whole community. That means not only global functions, also regional and local functions to have the, the playground, no, the, the platform. So uh, like our own chat GPT, which is a bias of GPT, BGPT. In English, <laughs> it's very difficult. So <laughs> we GPT because you need to have a safe environment, ensure that your information is not passed on to the internet. So if you, that give, if you give that to the uh, broader audience, then you ensure also ideations are somehow spilled up to uh, the top to the global functions. No. Is it, you had to transform a little bit your team. That's where how, how I started introducing a little bit yeah. uh, yourself at the beginning. How do you think you had to transform specifically uh, if, if, if you had for Gen AI or maybe for AI first and then Gen AI second? Or if actually I mean, you need a bit that... Uh, actual, yeah, exactly. And it was the real well, was actually. It was not intentionally just done for Chen AI, honestly. It was yeah. done to enable the organization to digitalize, to transform, you know, to, to have the digital transformation for the whole company. And that was, it sounds probably ridiculous to you or easy, but as you always were functional oriented, you also had given budget to functions. And if you then just imagine that you had an engineer for marketing, you had a a uh, report builder for marketing and then you had an architect what happened if the budget got shift then uh, we were all it was almost impossible to shift these people to other projects because from the mindset they were linked to their functions and that is very difficult that's why we split it and it's easy into capabilities so we have the data people we have the engineering no we have the reports guys we have the scientists and uh, that at least helped us to ensure in the IT a proper capability uh, building as well because they train each other. So Stefan is taking care that his people are really up to speed on technology. What is much more important is how you train and enable the business because that's what I said. We, of course, we can take care of our own, but there is an ecosystem necessary to lift all these cases and that is a bit more critical. We play a role, but we need to take the business into the responsibility as well and that we do with separate yeah if I, if I go a step further do you believe uh the board the 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 c level needs yes. to be a bit more educated needs to be a bit more in it or do you think actually they get it and it's more yeah <laughs> but that's it's a, it's a report 
supported. No, yeah, no, supported. Yeah, no, yeah. Supported. Yeah, yeah. I think they are in it, but they need to be educated. <laughs> and they are aware of it. And that is a nice yeah. thing. No? So and we can talk about all that stuff because but, yeah. it is not only the C <laughs> level, it is not only the C level, it is also the BPs. It is us uh, getting in touch with the technology. And there are simple yeah. places like um, we, we, we just recently did it on a global finance leadership congress. And we did it hands on. We made a promptathon with them, not a hackathon, a promptathon. Because everybody said, oh, yeah, Jenny, I, I know it. Most of them, no, let's say yes. But we gave them just an hour and a, a task to really get the strategy out of any general any read modes of different company and what is in for buyer stuff. You cannot imagine how hard that was for these people as well. It was not so easy because asking the right questions, phrasing it correctly, giving a, a context interesting, and knowing what you want uh, made them also aware of, okay, yeah, it's not only technology, it's the idea, it's what you need. Right. And that is something what helps them to educate as well uh, the senior management. Yeah, because digital is visual, right? You know, you have to see what a website is, exactly. but generally I need to experience, experiment it in order to know what it is. Yes. Thank you very much. George, uh, quick question to you. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it with my notes as well. Uh, yeah, I wanted to come back to one of the activities that you run around executive search and I'm talking about the people aspect. Do you, did you see a difference in the type of profile that company CEOs are looking for in the age of Gen AI? Or do you think actually it's the same people, it's just that Gen AI is just another thing they need to know, but the people have not changed per se, the profiles have changed, still the same type of profile people are looking for. I think it depends on the size of business, how much funding you've got, um, what the business objectives are. If you're an enterprise organization with deep pockets, then going after some of the latest and greatest, you know, mathematicians, data scientists, prompt engineers, you know, et cetera. And you can actually build an experiment and run, you know, have a use case workshops and then come up with an outcome. Then, yeah, you you have a particular type of business that looks for that capability. But if you're a mid-tier, sub half a billion, and, you know, there is still a lot of gaps and holes in the way your processes are, the way you adopt technology, the way you change your organization, then the conversations are more around... You know, from a from a people perspective, how do we bring in the right change people or business people and strategic people to start thinking about how do we elevate our business? And Gen AI is just a, one of the technology tools in, you know, a whole roster of applications and outcomes, right? To then generate a result for the business. If you're a PE firm with, you know, 20 million revenue and you're going to do 10 acquisitions to get to 100 uh, million for a 10x, right? There are particular activities that need to happen to get that result. If you're a business that wants to IPO, there are activities to get that result. So if CEOs aren't focusing on capability. CFOs aren't thinking about capability. They're thinking about how much sales can I make and value for the investor. And CFOs are thinking about how do I improve my cost margin? and do the right thing. So if Gen AI can contribute to those two things, then they're obviously open to suggestion. If it can't, and the business isn't geared up for it, then they're not mature enough as an organization to adopt that technology. Yeah, all right. And Ian, what, what's your perspective on that, on, on like the new roles, the new type of people that you as a CTO, you need either in your team or around your team to make Gen AI happen? And, and do you think is the role of the CTO to own that agenda of, of Gen AI, or it's not even like an agenda, it's just everyone has their own. No, absolutely. Um, so it, the, the, the smartest thing you can do, as, as uh, I believe anyway, uh, one of the smartest things you can do as a CTO is pick the right partners to work with as well and understand that your organization is not going to know everything. The people in your organization only know what they knew and where they came from. If you're an organization like the ones that I've worked in, where you are heavily M&A driven, you know, you've got to understand that a large percentage of the people that sit inside your business today as a group, if you're at a group function as I am now um, and have been historically, the largest business they've ever worked for is the one they're in today. So to expect them to understand it, it, internally only how to get to tomorrow 
is a very, very hard concept for the, some of these people. I mean, there's, a lot of them are often struggling with where they are right now because they've been elevated into this, into this enterprise organization and group from being a small business of maybe 30, 40 people or whatever it is. But, and when we, you're, you're heavily M&A focused like I have been over the last few years, that's something you've got to be really conscious of with your technology teams. It's a hard enough job to integrate cultures like that anyway. Should the CTO own the uh, AI agenda? I, I think there's a role to play there. I think the executive and the senior leadership team in the organization needs to own it collectively. Uh, are you accountable for the outcomes of that and responsible for how they work inside the confines of a racing matrix? Yeah, I am. Of course I am. Um, but picking the right partners to work with to augment the internal organization, especially technology teams and DevOps and en engineering teams and testing teams, and these places where generative AI can really help um, are are things that it, and, and when you do that you have to make sure that you know you don't have the whole oh no the, the CTOs come in and there's going to go and replace everybody with third party relationships you, you can't do that because a that's foolish and b you lose knowledge and understanding of your own intellectual property inside the organization so building that cultural responsibility where you're working with your teams to understand what their journey in the organization looks like and giving them a career path and also helping people grow their careers and understanding of working with new technologies you know, you can't expect a, a, a dev team that's just spent the last 10 years working with a legacy .NET product to all of a sudden understand how to build a generative AI capability and how to use a code pilot to, to actually help them write better code or how to or a content team to use, um, a, you know, a, a GPT across, but not even not necessarily open because I'm, I'm with you on that one. You know, you've got to be very, very careful about, you know, just leveraging open, open source capabilities, particularly in things like chatbots. Yeah. You know, you don't want the answers to come back incorrect, or you certainly don't want it to come back. You give the information to, that, that, that that's going to be detrimental to your organisation, and not letting the development teams and, and the R and D teams to have a free for all and put some guardrails around these things. Absolutely, that's part of my agenda in the compliance space and working with the compliance teams and the and, and security to make sure that they're the things we're doing. Thank you very much. I mean, there is, uh, yeah, trust me. Yeah, so I liked very much what you said. And yeah. we, and it is also checked with us in the IT. We now just came up with an AI policy that we are not creating any AI models in our media campaigns because we need natural skin and natural people uh, where the cream is applied. No, because otherwise, how can you trust that product? That is something which is also kind of a limitation in, in a corporation or the society really has to set these kind of limits. Of course, the background can be done, but not the models. Cool, yeah, so that was a question for the, for the, for the, for the audience. So any, anyone wants to react to it? And I think we can open also questions anyway. Pascal, I have a question for the fire stuff. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can. Well, uh, I'm just curious to understand, you made a switch into, uh, you chose to move into the IT organization. This is a quite a brave thing to do, right? Because often, as you said, IT is focused on infrastructure and yeah. keeping everyone going. Um, what was your experience uh, in terms of how the rest of the organization saw you? Did you Was it more easy to become kind of this enterprise information and analytics and resource that they could use once you were in IT uh, versus when you were distributed throughout the organization? I would probably say yes, because IT is still seen as a neutral place, no? So you do data analytics for the whole company. Once you do that out of finance, even if you claim to be neutral, nah, somehow you are efficiency, yeah. uh, efficiently driven uh, with the profitability and so on. But the success factor was not just that we moved into the IT, we kept the relations with the business by creating... Um, S spoke units we, we call that so the hub we are the coes and the, sp the hub and then we had the spokes in every single functions um which are just yeah multiplying what we are doing because you can't be everywhere and the global functions as we discussed they have to get the reach into the regions into the local countries and gather the ideas and so on so we have our partners in crime i would call it um in the business in every function more or less sitting thank you Okay.